I'm going to show you something very, very, very powerful, okay? Look at Colossians. In the book of Colossians, it says this, in Christ, here the context refers to Christ, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. Whoa. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then God says, but you know something? You are complete in Christ. God has put you in Christ and you are complete. Amen. The amazing thing, church, is this. God says you are righteous. There are, there, are, there are preaching going on in churches today that says, you know, if you are holy enough, one day you'll be righteous. No, 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 my friend. You are complete in Christ. You are not less complete than one who is 10 years Christian. You are complete in Christ. And in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what we have done is that we take the starting post, you are complete in Christ. And we have, we have made it the finishing post. That's the problem. We tell people, one day, the finishing post. We think in the natural. We think like a human. Instead of reasoning from God downwards, we are reasoning from man upwards. God's reasoning, God's, God's reality is that you are complete in Christ. Even though you're safe this morning, you're complete in Christ. Now walk out that completeness. And if you fall and appear incomplete, you're still complete. Your fall does not incomplete you because your action in the first place did not complete you. It was Christ. So, that's a starting post. The starting post is you're complete. Don't make the starting post the finishing post. You gotta be careful with this man's teachings. Even your friends, your colleagues, I can tell you this. This is not natural teaching. Grace is not natural. What is natural is this. Do your best to please God. And one of these days, if God sees that you are sincere enough, you're earnest enough, you know, maybe you'll be more complete than John over there, than Lucy over there, you'll be better off. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I might exaggerate a little bit here, but that's what people think. It is, it is, it boggles your mind to say you are complete to start off. Now with that sense of completeness, walk out. I want to show you something, and uh, because of time, this is winding down. I'm going to show you something back to back, okay? And I'm a contextual preacher, which means I preach things in context, in the way it appears in the Bible. In John 19, it's a story of the cross, right? Why did Jesus cry at the cross towards the end? It is finished, all right? It is finished. John 19, verse 30, he cried, it is finished. Am I right? That's where it all starts. Where he cried, finish, we start. We start our Christian life with the finished work. When Jesus says, it is finished, what is finished? The cup that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, full of our sin, full of our curse, full of our judgment. He drained, he drank it, he drained it dry. This very last dregs. Finish. The judgment is gone. There's no more judgment for you and me. Amen. What about God's law? Satisfied. Amen. What about God's holiness? Magnified. Because God's holiness says, if you sin, you die. Somebody died. God did not say, okay, never mind. I'll compromise my holiness. No. Jesus died. In our place. God's holiness is magnified. God's love expressed for men, for sinful men. It's finished. His first words recorded in the Bible when he was 12 years old was this. Didn't you know? He told his father and mother, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? His first recorded words. His last word was finish in the Gospel of John. His earthly life. What was finished? The Father's business. To have our sins forgiven righteously on a judicial foundation. Hmm? Then, this is John 19, right? Then he rose from the dead. On the third day, 
The disciples were afraid. They were in the upper room. They were hiding behind closed doors. Jesus appeared and he shows them his wounds, which is the righteous foundation for, for him to say this, peace be unto you. So peace be with you comes next. John 20, that's John 19, it is finished. John 20, in the next chapter, peace be with you. Huh? Peace is founded on the finished work. And then the next chapter, we are going to John 21 now. One week after he rose from the dead, he was walking by the lake of Galilee. The fishermen, uh, his disciples were fishing in the lake of Galilee. You all know the story. He made breakfast for them. After he finished breakfast with them, he asked this question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Next chapter, John 21. Look at the sequence. Do you love me? Comes after it is finished. Peace comes based on the finished work. Then he asked, do you love me? I'm going in order, people. The order of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that chapter 21, he looked at Peter and said, you follow me. You follow me. You got it? Now, the true Christian life starts with, is predicated on, it is finished. You're complete in Christ. It's finished. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. Now you should possess the peace. He says, peace be with you. Receive it. Therefore, being made righteous with God, we have peace. Amen. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace Amen. with God. Okay? Possess it. Then after that, he asks you a next question. After you are resting in the finished work, after you are enjoying the peace with God, you know that there's no, no more war between you and, there's nothing, you know, between you and God anymore. God is your father. You're so close to him. He asks, after all that I've done for you, is there anything in me that you see that will cause you to love me? It's a question. We say yes. Then he asks, do you love me? And then when you say, yes, Lord, I love you, then he says, follow me. Get it? I'll tell you what traditional Christianity teaches. Start from here. They teach you, begin to follow Christ. All right? And do your best to love him. Do your best to love him. And then you will have peace <laughs> when the work is finished. Don't laugh. How many of us still believe this? And I've showed you the, the sequence of the appearance of these words. Amen, church? Now, there was a man, there was a man who was caught in a breach of the law of his land. It was obviously a breach of the new found law, okay, new founded law. And he himself did not deny he broke the law. His enemies admit he broke the law. His friends would say, it is the law. But one thing about this guy, the culprit, he's not, he's not too particular about the fact he broke the law. He is almost at peace. The only one who is concerned is the king who loved him. The king of the land who loved him. I'm talking about the story of Daniel. Daniel has King Darius, the Middle Persian emperor, King Darius. In fact, you can even see his face in history. They have uh, notched his face into uh, clay tablets. You can see in the museum. That's the King Darius of Daniel. King Darius loved Daniel. But his satraps, his governors around him, his leaders around him, they were jealous of Daniel because the king kept on promoting him. And Daniel was not even a Middle Persian. Daniel is a Jew. He was a captive from Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, all right, he took Daniel and all his, 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 his people with, with him. But of course now, Darius has conquered Babylon and the Middle Persian took over. And King Darius loved Daniel because Daniel was able to interpret dreams, give him counsel, sweet spirit. And the Bible says that in Daniel was found an excellent spirit. And the king thought to put him above all the satraps and all the governors of the kingdom. So they were jealous of him. 
So one day they came and they realized they, they have no, nothing against Daniel. Daniel was faithful, the Bible says. The only thing, the only fault they can find with Daniel with, with his God. Still to come today. What happened to Daniel has happened to all of us by substitute. Jesus is our Daniel. He went to the lion's den for you and I because the law cannot be broken. But instead of us going, Jesus went. On a, that's what I mean, Christ died for us. Stay tuned. Joseph Prince will be right back. You can enjoy provision, protection, and unshakable peace today when you receive the gift of righteousness that Jesus has made forever yours. As a thank you for your gift of any amount, receive Joseph's latest three-CD audio series, Forever Yours, and the bonus Reign in Life 2015 wall calendar. Find out how you can enjoy every blessing in Christ. For a specific gift, we'll send you the Forever Yours special gift collection that includes the brand new Right Believing capsule with 55 powerful messages that will change what you believe and change your life. This collection also contains Joseph's latest The Power to Reign CD, DVD, and journal set and other exciting resources that will bless you. For more information on how to order these resources, call us toll free at 1-877-769-5433 or visit us at josephprince.org today. Daniel was faithful, the Bible says. The only thing, the only fault they can find with Daniel with, with his God. So they came to the king and they told the king, king, why don't we do this, all right? For, for a certain length of time, let's have a law in honor of you that no man in your kingdom, in your realm, should make a request or pray to any man or any God except to you. How about that? And King Darius, being a busy man as he is, you know, with other things on his mind, he just agreed, all right, and put a signet on the law, the clay tablet. One thing about the law of the Middle Persians, it cannot be altered. Once it is made law, it cannot be changed. And true enough, they waited for Daniel to pray. And the Bible says Daniel, knowing that the law was enacted, he went up to his upper room chamber. Before all of them, he knelt down and prayed towards Jerusalem. He prayed, the Bible tells us, openly. And straight away they went to the king and said, King, you have this law, don't you? And the king says, yes. That anyone should not make requests of any, any man or deity except to you. And the king says, yes. And uh, well, Daniel, the moment the king heard Daniel, the Bible says the king, read carefully, it says the king was displeased with himself, not with Daniel. The king loved Daniel. The king realized that he was set in a trap. And they told the king, and remember this king, O majesty, O most noble one whose flatulence is as a perfume of the night. <laughs> oh, most noble one. The law of the mid-Persian cannot be altered. The king has put his authority on it. And the king understood that. And the Bible says the king labored all day until sundown. That's in the Bible. It says he labored all day to try to find a way to deliver Daniel out of the lion's den. Oh, by the way, the, the consequence is that whoever does that will be thrown into the lion's den. So the Bible says he labored all day until at night, until the, the going down of the sun. And towards the evening, other governors came to him and says, remember this, O majesty, we are concerned for your kingdom. The law of the mid persian cannot be altered. At the end of, so, so, so we have a king here whose law and his heart does not match. His heart was all for Daniel, one direction. His law was going in another direction, to throw Daniel into the lion's den. To keep both, he cannot. He must either do violence to his heart, his love for Daniel, or satisfy the claims of justice, his justice. But to do both, he cannot. At the end of the day, justice won. The king reluctantly says, go ahead, take him. So they took Daniel and they threw him 
into the den full of lions. By the way, these are ferocious lions. These are not pussy cats. <laughs> They're not meow, okay? These are ferocious lions. How do I know that? Because later on, when the enemies were thrown in, even before their bodies hit bottom, their bones were crushed by the lions. And the Bible says that night, after Daniel was in the lion's den, the king could not sleep. They didn't bring dancing women before him. One translation says that. They didn't bring music before him. His sleep departed, he could not sleep. Early in, the, oh, by the way, when he, threw, he, 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 took, he took Daniel into the lion's den, Daniel, last words Daniel heard was this. The king says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And the Bible says, he did not sleep that night. The next morning he got up, he went quickly, the Bible says, to the Daniel's lion's den, and um, he says, oh Daniel, has your God delivered you? Let's follow the story here. Then the king arose very early in the morning, went in haste to the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver from the lions? Next. Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O oh, king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him. Not just glad, <laughs> you know, he loved Daniel. And commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. But watch this, next. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Bam, their children, their wives and the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So I told you, these are, these are real ferocious lions. They have not eaten for days. Now, the Bible records twice the accusers came to the king and reminded him the law cannot be changed. Now, supposing for the sake of illustration, look up here, just for the sake of illustration, okay? I'm closing with this. Just suppose that between the first coming, reminding the king, and the second coming, in between, the king actually threw Daniel already in the lion's den. Okay? But these accusers do not know. So the second time they come to the king, and they say, King, we just want to remind you that the law cannot be altered. The king says, yes, definitely not. They look at the king. And the law says that you are to judge Daniel and throw him into the lion's den. He says, I certainly will not. Now remember, we're talking about after he has thrown, nothing has happened to Daniel, and he brought Daniel out, and they did not know. So the accusers come, okay? And he says, of course not. Uh, but, oh, but you just said that the law must be kept. Certainly. Daniel broke the law. Yes, he did. You have to throw him. I, I most certainly will not. King, O thou, whose toe jam is the delicacy of the poor. <laughs> you know how they flatter the king. Oh king, we are concerned and jealous for your honor. This will put a blot to your name, to your dynasty, and it will be a lasting disgrace upon the honor of your excellent name if you don't throw him. He said, no, I'm as righteous yesterday when I threw him as today. I'm as righteous in not throwing him in. You know why? Because he has served his sentence. Now stop here and let's bring this to a close. What happened to Daniel has happened to all of us by substitute. Jesus is our Daniel. He went to the lion's den for you and I because the law cannot be broken. But all of us have broken the law the law of the king. All of us, okay? And but instead of us going, Jesus went. On a, that's what I mean, Christ died for us. What is for us? As us. Instead, instead. In English, instead means in the place of. Us. So like Daniel, Jesus went to the lion's den, the cross, took all the judgment that was meant for you and I because of the broken laws 
in our lives, we have violated God's commandments. Amen. He took our place. He was punished to the fullest extent for all our sins. And then he cried, finished. And the king, God the Father, raised him from the dead out of the, de the place of judgment, the lion's den. Amen. And he did it all not for himself. He did it for you and I. So now the accuser, usually through the mouths of people, but the person behind the accusation is actually the devil, who is called the accuser. Use the mouth of people. They'll come and say, but so-and-so broke the law. Even today, come to you. But so-and-so has, God, he has done this. He has done that. He must go. And God says, no, he will not. And when I say he will not, I'm as righteous as when I send my son to the tree to die for their sins. Today, I'm righteous in not condemning my people. If I condemn my people when their substitute was condemned for their sins, it's a miscarriage of justice. I will be unrighteous. I will be unrighteous. So I cannot be unrighteous. It will be a blot on the name and the throne of the holy God who created the heavens and the earth. I cannot judge them. I cannot condemn them when they have belief on my gift, on my son, the, their substitute. And because of that, I'm as righteous in clearing them from guilt as I am in sending their substitute on their behalf. Can you understand that? When I was reading this, yesterday the Lord spoke to me. But son, see what happened to all the accusers. They were thrown with their wives and their children into the lion's den. I want to tell you something, church. When it comes to another child of God, whatever it is, what God has cleansed, don't you call unclean. You don't know the full story. You don't know uh, whatever it is. Don't be an accuser. Don't do Satan's work for him. Okay? It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And we know who the lion is today. Who goes about as a roaring lion. But the only ones that he can devour based on this verse is are the ones who accuse others. In other words, they are like him. Hmm? Another thing, you should not accuse yourself either. And all the people said. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. You have watched highlights of a sermon by Joseph Prince. To order a copy of the full sermon, which is approximately 60 minutes,